All right, so we're going to start with something pretty easy. Um, let me ask you to just call out for me, let's say, 20 separate emotions. So the first emotion that comes to mind. Pet. Fear. What did Pet. you say? Pet. Happy. 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 Which is happy. happy. <laughs> Fear. Sadness. Sadness. Anger. Anger. Humor. Scared. Humor. Rage. Who? Rage. Rage. <laughs> Facial expression a little scary there. All right. Determination. Determination. Okay. Love. Love. Oh. Excitement. Excitement. Embarrassment. Embarrassment. <laughs> Comes after rage. <laughs> Comes after the speaker calling you out for saying something. Frustration. Frustration. Any others? Boredom. Boredom. Impatience. Impatience. She says, as he did 11 out of 20. Okay. <laughs> Stress. Stress. Feeling stressed? Sure. Worry. Worry. Malaise. Malaise. <laughs> Frustration. That's some of that smart language going on. All right. Whatever, Terry. That's the easy one. No, that's good. What was? What else did I hear? Peak. Peak. P i q u e. Oh. Okay. Now we're playing. Now we're playing. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing. Uh, the the funny thing about emotions and how we handle them. It is that all of you, as you were coming in, you were saying hello, I was saying hello. And when somebody says, hey, how are you? What's your answer? Uh, Fine, I didn't hear that one. Fabulous. Fabulous. Good. Good. Great. Well. well great. Doing well. Super. Okay. Super. So we don't really get these emotions out there very much. So what I'd like to do over the next little while um, is I want to talk emotional intelligence. I want to talk a little bit about IQ so that we have a context for it and then we're going to get into it. Um, it's complicated and even, you know, the, the running thing, I, I tend to speak um, on different topics and different kinds of groups and there is this eye raiser whenever you say, okay, you, sir, are going to speak to a room full of women about emotions. This should go well. <laughs> um, and so, uh, in order to help, I have an assistant, uh, Mr. Emotional Intelligence, and we'll start with him to kind of help us get a contact. <laughs> There's hardly anything that escapes my notice. When I walk into a room, I can usually just sense if people are mad or sad or happy. Ted, I need the report on my desk by five. No more discussion. I sent you that report last week. You didn't get it? I got it. But do you not recall our conversation? It is not what I need. It does not have all the details. I can, I can just feel it. It's like a, it's like a superhuman sense. Ah, that's the smell of happiness, friend. I can't help it if there were holes in the report because you didn't do your job. It's like a smell, really. Or, who's hurting? Somebody's sad in this room. Man, I can just laser beam in on those emotions and see them, feel them. It's uncanny. I sent you that email two weeks ago. You were not there. Oh, that's good. Hey, you guys have lunch plans later? All right. Just have to report on my desk by five. Bye. So, um, emotional intelligence, of course, is a little bit of a sensitivity to something more than just intelligence. Intelligence. And don't worry, we'll see Mr. Emotional Intelligence again. Um, once you get permission to use the video, you can use all of them. So we'll get to um, and so, when we talk about intelligence, we're talking about uh, things like our capacity for knowledge. Now, a lot of people disagree about intelligence, believe it or not, but it's an academic term, and academics publish by disagreeing. So, we've been disagreeing about this for a long time. But, but the kind of boils down to this. When we say somebody has a high IQ and that they're intelligence, we, intelligent, we mean that they have a high capacity for knowledge. They can absorb knowledge and that they have that ability to learn knowledge. Um, 
typically they have verbal skills because we can't really access their intelligence unless you know they have language skills to portray that intelligence and they have language skills to understand what it is that they're bringing in. They tend to have, when we talk about intelligence, spatial ability. And, and that has to do with just the understanding of objects in relation to other objects. And it'll vary. But in a typical intelligence test, there's going to be some aspect of that that, re that reflects not only one's ability to understand what they're reading, but also their ability to conceptualize how different objects exist in space um, and how they can be manipulated. Someone who is intelligent, most people would agree, um, has an ability to understand the information that they bring in. And the more intelligent that they are, uh, this is a, actually a very high level of uh, the assessment of intelligence, is that, that uh, I will read something, if I'm intelligent, um, I will read something, I'll take that data in, and I'll understand it pretty easily. And I do that, by the way, by taking the data that I'm taking in, combining it with data that I already have, and that's how I develop the knowledge that I have, and that's considered to be intelligent. And I'm able to reason with it, um, that I'm able to take the knowledge and do something with it. Again, it has to do with taking different pieces of data, different pieces of knowledge I have, putting them together, and coming out with a solution for a problem. And then finally, my ability to grasp complexity. And a very large part of a typical IQ test, for example, has to do with this last ability. It has to do to be able to take a complex situation and figure out what are the main things that I need to know and what do I do with them. And interestingly enough, these are all things that we also teach. Now, we don't necessarily teach them in every class, obviously, but when we talk about acumen, like in the graduate school, when we talk about business acumen, we're talking about the ability to take disparate pieces of information and tie them together to create new knowledge and new information and tools and all of this. So that is sort of typically what we think of when we think of uh, typical or standard intelligence. So what's emotional intelligence? Well, there are also a lot of different models of this, but there are some pretty standard ones. So the test that you took, and we're going to get into that in a little while, um, takes these four areas and breaks them up into five different categories. But emotional intelligence talks about self-awareness. So in order for me to, to be emotionally intelligent, I have to be aware not only of what's happening inside me, but also how I am being portrayed to you. And so people who are highly emotionally intelligent understand how they are represented in the minds of other people. Um, there's also this element of managing emotions. So the fact that I have them doesn't make me emotionally intelligent. It makes me normal-ish, uh, right? Um, but the fact that I can manage them is what brings about this notion of emotional intelligence. Empathy. Empathy, and we'll get to this a, a little bit later, of course. Empathy, not sympathy. Empathy is my ability to understand the emotions that you have. And not just to be able to label them, as our friend did earlier, erroneously, uh, but be able to understand what's going on in the moment. So, you know, when you come in and you're upset, or you come in and you're happy, if I have empathy, I understand where you're coming from. That's it. But it's a very difficult task for a lot of us to accomplish. And then finally, social skill. We are social animals, and as a result, um, we, the highly emotionally intelligent person, has the ability to understand how to use those emotions, how to portray the emotions, and how to interact with the emotions of other people in a way that's effective. Because if I have all of these emotions and I have nobody that I'm interacting with and I'm not doing it very well, then I have this particular problem uh, in my relationships and my understanding and a lot of different things. So there are some interesting things about this perspective of emotional intelligence, and I still run into this. This is a topic that I speak on relatively frequently. Um, I have done this topic as an internal workshop or internal session within companies. And in those settings, you will have people who say, look, it's fine that we're going to talk about emotional intelligence, but emotions keep getting in our way. What we need to do is to get into a situation where the emotions don't distract us because they, they, they get in the process of us solving a problem because people are ticked off or people are whatever they are, overly excited. 
They increase our vulnerability, so I am not talking to you about how I feel about this. Thank you very much. It's mine, my emotion. Now, I'm not just talking about the typical, I've made myself vulnerable. This is a very real thing. I'm in a meeting with my boss. I share how I feel about the direction that she's going, and I potentially then position myself in a negative way, or at least in my mind I do, because it makes me vulnerable. And it says something about me specifically, and I'm not really sure that I have the relationship uh, comfort to do that. Emotions get in the way of our judgment. They get in the way of data, because I'm only going to be selective about my data. We talk about this a lot in the graduate training about the fact that we have these biases and the more emotional that I am in this um, environment, the more likely I'm going to select the data that supports my bias and ignore the data that doesn't. And I'm sorry, that inhibits the free flow of data because you're not going to tell me everything. And as a result, we need to control it. And so a lot of people have a mindset that says, well, first of all, let's get the emotions off the table so we can focus on the problem. There's also some language I hear a lot, and that is, I leave my emotions at the door. So, here's your first insight. No, you don't. You don't do that. Your emotions are your emotions. They come with you. You might do something else with them, but your ability to just discard them, that's a game that you're playing with yourself. They're there. So high performers, on the other hand, say, you know what, Motiva uh, emotions motivate us. If I go into this meeting and I'm not happy about what it's going to, that what the outcome might do to my colleagues or my students, or I just think that it's wrong, I can use that emotion to put together a case to actually have a successful conversation about this. It increases our confidence because our emotions are a check for us. So we don't have time to get into all of that, but in, uh, my background is in organizational behavior and psychology. So the stuff that kind of geeks me on some of this, typically folks are like, yeah, 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 fine, go ahead. Um, but our emotions really are a pretty good barometer about are we on track or are we not? Um, and actually they speed up our analysis. When we have a goal in mind, we're excited about that goal or we're excited about what the potential outcome of that goal could be, we can get down to it. And teams that you've worked on that have been excited about what they do and they've been really looking forward to it, they take data in quickly and they analyze it because they're, they're, they're really jazzed by where it's going to go. So the interesting thing about emotions and trust, by the way, so we have this meeting and Rachel comes in and she's uh, absolutely excited, over the top about the topic that we're talking about, and I am not only not excited, I'm a little upset that we're talking about it. One thing I could do is go with the traditionalist view and keep my upset to myself, let her be excited, and then I promise at some point I'm not going to be delivering 100% on this game because I am unhappy about it. Or I can be very transparent about not only what I feel, but why I feel it. And if she's also transparent about what she feels and why she feels it, we actually are able to walk out of a room going, you know what, I don't agree with you, but I trust you because we said everything that was needed to be said. We shared these emotions. If she walks out of the room saying he did not say what he felt, so it's going to come up in the next meeting, or what he promised to do, he may not do. And that deteriorates trust, trust and honesty. Provides vital feedback, and for high, um, high performers, we believe that emotions have to be managed. My favorite people, not necessarily, are the ones who say, you're going to take me how I am. Yes, I know I'm a jerk in that meeting, but you know what? I'm authentic. That's just who I am. Man, I love being with you. <laughs> okay, you feel passionately about this. Don't care. Back it up, let's do something together. Let's figure out how to do this. So the high performer says, I've gotta be selective. I've gotta be able to manage the emotions that I have, but I need to have them. And I need to not be afraid of it. And by the way, I need to let you have them too. Because that's how we build relationships, that's how we build trust, that's how we work together. So why is this important? Well, one of the reasons it's important to you, because all of you work here, or you're associated with people who work here, is that there are some interesting things about IQ, which we have loved IQ for a long, long time. It has lost favor. I don't know exactly. I, I think I do know that IQ is not 
particularly used in the HR setting here. It's lost favor in HR, but it used to be a really important element. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't do very well in predicting much of anything. It predicts certain levels of school um, performance in certain specific topics, but even there it's questionable. What it doesn't predict at all is how leaders lead. It doesn't predict how people have relationships with each other. And it doesn't predict the ability for people to be social. And in an environment like ours, social is important because that's how we work. You'll notice I'm flipping each page, that way I can be surprised by what I'm going to say next. <laughs> so here's a couple, I obviously thought I had a clicker. Why I'm going back and forth is I don't have a clicker. So I, this, uh, this, I could carry the keyboard with me like a, like a, like a guitar. Push the button that way. Um, so when we talk about emotional intelligence, if I look at the research, and there is research behind this, all you analytical folks, if you really want to know what this research is, send me an email and I'll cite you to death. But it, there's research behind this. Um, that when it comes to long-term success, when it comes to measures of success in work, uh, as measured by promotion, but also as measured by personal uh, goals and all of this, EQ is four times better a predictor than IQ uh, across industries. Um, also, and this is a little bit complicated, so just go with it here. This is a study you can see if you have nothing to do with the rest of your life. Um, but EQ has a 42% predictive uh, ability of high job satisfaction. It's mostly correlation, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, and so what it boils down to is that a large number of people that have a high level of IQ, uh, larger than those who have a low level of IQ, also have a high level of job satisfaction. Now you could say, does this, EQ, I'm sorry. So you could say, well, does this mean that they're better at choosing the job that fits them? And I would say, yeah, it could mean that. But it probably also means that they find reward in the work they do through their emotional satisfaction. And so that's one of the reasons that we want to know about it, because those who are satisfied tend to stay longer and be more productive. And then finally, it has been found as a predictor of leadership success. This is also a little fuzzy, um, but there have been a ton of studies that tried to associate people who have been measured as highly successful leaders with their IQ, and there is not a strong correlation between the two. Now, correlation is a cause, but you would expect those two to be traveling at about the same speed um, if the two were related, and it just simply doesn't seem like it is, that the ability to lead others and to inspire others to action is not a function of IQ as much as it is a function of emotional intelligence. So why would it be a better predictor? Well, for one thing, our emotions make us human. <laughs> That's kind of who we are. Um, we don't yet know how to make artificial intelligence emotional. Uh, what's interesting is there are some, some algorithms that allow uh, artificial intelligence to respond as if it were an emotion, but it's not held by our machine friends. Um, it's something that we hold. It's, it's who we are. We are emotional critters. Most of us also don't work in a vacuum. I say most of us. I have said this in a group where someone said, not only do I work in a vacuum, but I work literally with vacuum. <laughs> And I was like, oh yeah, engineer town, sorry, forgot where I was. Um, but anyway, most of us don't work like that. Most of us collaborate on a frequent basis, and here's one you'll enjoy, although 70% say they don't like it. Right, so most of us, our job requires us to collaborate with people, but boy, you pull them out and say, are you loving the collaboration, or would you prefer just to take this on yourself? And 70% of people at some level of that go, you know, Get it done faster on my own. And then when you find out why, it's not because of the task. It's because of the relationship with the people that are in the collaboration. It's very, very specific. It's not just teams, it's the people in those teams. And then finally, your day is predicated on your relationships. You have a good day, you have a bad day. Some days you have an annoying day because you're sitting there working on a task and it's just not working. The math that is supposed to work isn't working. That's frustrating. People who are supposed to answer the phone aren't answering. That's frustrating. But most of us 
a large determination of whether our day went well or not is how we interacted with other people during that day. And there's some interesting studies about the fact that I could ruin your day in the first five minutes of your day if I really try. And we all know somebody who seems like maybe they do. Don't look at that person in this room. That's rude. Just keep looking up here. But anyway. So that's one of the ways that our day is set up. Okay. Relationships. I've got them all figured out. I need to talk to you about the Penske account. Now, we have a lot of work to do on this account, so I need you to be really, really focused on what we discussed last week. And we had a meeting with the Penske representatives two weeks ago. They were expecting some type of proposal last week, which we You know, the other day at lunch, I was through. thinking to myself, and we ought to be able to track our time with our phones. That, that would be a, 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 a possibility, but we really need to focus on this yeah, and situation that would be, because they are not... Imagine it, out on the golf course, hitting the balls with a client. Hey, I'm with John Atkinson. Well, I, I need to clock in. in. The boom, 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 boom. This information. Enough phone. And you said that you had I need to clock in. completed last and week, and it was yeah. almost done, but they need more in. information. It's tracking my time. And I need for you to really be focused on what we're trying to get accomplished with this specific account. Now... Our time tracking software just drives me bananas. How many times am I at my desk? I have to be at my computer to clock in to let people We're know. We're not talking about tracking time. I can't remember what I was doing at right noon at the end of the day. I'd lose time. Will, can you focus on what we're trying to discuss here? I'm trying to discuss our time clock. Uh, well, it's not but working we, for me. We need to be focused on the Penske account. All See, right? So I've been looking on my phone, and I think I've counted at least 55 applications on here. It can't be that hard to put one together. No, I, I imagine it can't be. But that is not what we're discussing here. In we're fact, look at this one. Look at this one. Look at this one. It's a little dog. Are you listening to anything that you watch like? the dog, and after a while, he starts licking the screen? We are not concerned about the dog. We are concerned about licking the Don't It's a riot. It. Oh, man. Look at you, crazy dog. Still got nuts in my teeth. All right. You don't know anybody like that either, I'm sure, so we'll just pretend like they're making up. All right, so to get into motions, this is the stuff. I used to include this in one of my classes, and I realized that the blank stares I got from people were not nearly as excited as I was about talking about it, right? So I am not going to do this for a long time, but I am going to mention this for a minute, and that is that we were built with emotions in mind. And we got this little tiny part that's way down in the middle of our brain called the amygdala, um, and it's there to help us survive. And the amygdala doesn't realize that we're not being chased by large animals anymore. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about rocks falling off of mountains and covering the front of our cave, right? I mean, it's, but, but it is that piece that says, stop thinking, you've got to do something. And that's where our emotions live. And that's why for a lot of us, when we start to get, and, and those who are skilled, by the way, in emotional intelligence know that, when you start to feel yourself getting upset and you realize that within a moment or two you are going to have rage as opposed to a little level of frustration, that's the amygdala saying it is time for you to fight or to flee, but you got to do it. And as soon as the amygdala kicks in, we are on drugs. Because the body takes over, it does all of this interesting stuff. This is the part where I would get into, and all of the students would go, oh, dear Lord, it's an MBA program. Please stop talking. Anyway, my point is that these emotions develop for a reason. Uh, there's, there's a really biological purpose, so you can't just simply say, I'm not emotional. For one thing, it's a signaling function. We get emotions because we might need to take action. Even with love, I mean, this emotion comes from a very non-romantic place, right? We won't go there either, but the point is that we get that emotion because we go, oh, look, a potential mate. How cute. I need to do something. And we can talk about how effective that is. But um, It also promotes patterns of physiological change. By that, I mean I do things, I get upset, I do things, I get upset, I do things, I get upset, I learn that I either need to stop doing those things, or interestingly enough, my actual physiology will adjust to these emotions at some times. That's why in some cases you go into a situation where you are absolutely excited, and you're excited about it every single time until the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth time, 
and now it's okay, but you're not as excited as you were. Right? So our body actually makes changes as a result of our emotions. And it gives us that strong impulse to make something happen. So emotions drive behavior. An easy way for me to just do that. Um, they arouse, they, arouse, they sustain, they, 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 they point us in the right direction for activity. If we're not enjoying something, if we're not getting something out of it, if we're not getting pleasure from what we're doing, or we don't have some emotion driving us, we tend to stop doing it. Um, emotions are, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of the research that's out there, is that emotions are not different than, uh, or emotional intelligence is not in conflict with standard intelligence, it is a part of it, and in fact is a higher order of it, that the people who, who have a high level of emotional intelligence um, actually are able to process information rationally better than those who aren't. Because we have more data, we have more energy behind it, we have more feelings behind it. And this last part um, is emotional intelligence is not, sometimes our emotions are not as random as we sometimes think. They use tons of data. It's pretty complicated. So uh, when I was sitting up here uh, earlier, one of the folks who were attending this meeting crawled under a table. She crawled under a table from where she was sitting to out here. Now, I'm sitting up here in the front, and I see her crawling under a table. And probably I can't even count the number of things that went on in the moment that I saw her crawling <laughs> under the table, right? But I'm quite sure I was paying attention to a ton of things. Because you can imagine somebody crawling under the table that was about to next be in your face, right? So the look on her face indicated that she wasn't angry. The way she was crawling looked a little bit fun. The things she was saying made it clear that this was not a threat. And so within microseconds. Just based on all of that information, I didn't have a feeling of fear. Actually, I thought it was kind of fun. And then my next thought process was, can I make fun of her and get away with it, or will it hurt her feel? <laughs> and so I poked a little bit, she poked back, and then I'm like, okay, we're good. You know, it's all fine. And um, uh, so all of this stuff happens at once, and we're pretty good at figuring it out. frightened at the same time. Good. You're frightened, but don't forget to smile. Being neurotic now. Way more neurotic. In love, so. With anger. More intellectual, but more shy, so. More ambiguous, yet neutral. Disgust. Depth. Add some defiance and disappointment. You're annoyed now. More old school. Then turn crazy. Dreamy now. Then anxious and intelligent. Something more melancholic with the euphoria and a little sadness. Happily sad. That's it. Cut. Yeah, I think we've got it. What do you think? <laughs> so we're, we're pretty good at interpreting that. We uh, are pretty good at knowing what those facial expressions mean and what body language means. And facial expressions, again, are an interesting topic across cultures. But So boiling it down, the short version for emotional intelligence, the capacity for recognizing our feelings and those of others, for motivating, our, for motivating ourselves to action, and for managing emotions well in ourselves and in our relationships. So, as I said, there are lots of models of emotional intelligence, and one of them is the one that your assessment was built around. Um, and so it takes these things that we talked about, and it puts them into five categories, of perceive, uh, perceiving, managing, decision-making, achieving, and influencing. And the reason why you want to do these things every once in a while is not that they are the answer to all questions. Self-assessments have a whole list of issues that come along with them that you know go from, from the ability of the participant to manipulate it to the awareness of whether the participant 
uh, it even knows how to answer it. And uh, one of the ones I know with this assessment that happens is that some of us don't, we never give ourselves an extreme score on either end. And so when you take a test, this is typically with a paper test, when you take a test like that and it's got these choices, we typically avoid one in five, so we've taken a five point scale and made it a three point scale. Uh, others of us will do it a four point scale. We will give ourselves a five and never a one, we'll give ourselves a one and never a five. Um, but the one that gets in the way actually sometimes gets in the way of the way that you took it as well, and that is that some of us unconsciously will answer it the way we wish it would be as opposed to exactly how it is. So whenever you do a test like this, the more sort of really thoughtful you are about uh, your own responses, the more accurate and useful it will be. If you become aware um, of your feelings and your ideas and you have something provokes some thinking about it, then that gives you a place to get better at it. So I want to take a few minutes now and I want to get into the report. And I am kind of buzzing along here uh, because I want to make sure that we have time to get through the report thing. But then please, if you have any questions at all, ask. Um, but uh, the report you did, and thank you for doing that. Um, because it allows you to take a little bit of a closer look. And I am going to um, briefly cover the five different areas just so you're clear on what actually you're measuring. Um, one of the issues with this assessment with lots of others is that the label that's used means one thing in common language, but when we put it in the context of emotional intelligence, it may mean something a little bit different. So, I'm not going to read everything to you, I just want to highlight what each of these five actually are. And the first category that should be in your handy dandy report has to do with perception. And perception as it relates to emotional intelligence is perception about the different emotions that I have and my ability to perceive different emotions in you. Not only the emotions, but the intensity of the emotion. So there are those who um, actually, if you look at any anger management kind of setting, often folks who are struggling with anger management, one of the things that they that they learn pretty pretty early in the process is that there are emotions between satisfied and angry. And there are a lot of folks who really aren't aware of that, right? So they're either happy or they're bad. And that has to do with the ability to discern what I'm feeling right now. It may not be anger, it may be annoyance, it may be frustration, it may be any of these things. And so that's the issue of perception, is to have the ability to identify and describe these things and to be able to understand them in other people. Um, highly perceptive individuals uh, tend to be authentic in their behavior and predictable in the sense that that I understand what's going on right now and I'm aware of that last one, I'm aware of my triggers, I know what sets me off. And so if I have control over these, then I have the ability, if I, if I feel that I'm going down that path um, or that you're going down that path, then I might consistently step in to help us deal with it. And so folks who have this part of emotional intelligence tend to be fairly predictable in how they handle their emotions. The second one was managing. And again, this comes down to the fact that because I have, uh, have them and I have them vividly, doesn't mean that I'm emotionally intelligent if I don't know what to do with them once I have them. Now, managing emotions is not just about not flying off the handle when I'm, when I'm feeling angry. It also means marshalling the emotions that I need in a particular situation. So I come in excited at the beginning of this project and now we've been working on this project for a week, and I, I, I am not naturally excited anymore, but I need to. I need to have that fire. I need to have something. And so people who have a high degree of ability to manage their emotions find it in themselves to remember what they were excited about, for example. Or they find it in themselves to, to bring um, you know, relaxation to a stressful situation. They're, they're able to recognize that the stress is happening because of the environment I'm in. The stress is not happening beyond that. It doesn't make me a bad person. It means I'm having a hard time with this. And so the management of stress is here. 
Then let emotional cues guide their actions. That one sounds scary um, because that one sounds like, well, if I'm bad, then I scream, and if I'm happy, then I laugh. That's not really it. A uh, highly emotional, intelligent person realizes I'm going into a situation that is likely to provoke anger or frustration or sarcasm. I've, I've decided to make sarcasm an emotion. It's the expression of an emotion, but I own it, so I'm just going to go with it. Um, and so I need to back off, because actually there are some feelings behind that that cause that to happen. Uh, managing emotions and impressions, um, and projecting this image of understanding to other people. And then decision making is sometimes the more difficult one when you're interpreting the report, because we think of decision making in a, in a different way than it's being conceptualized here. The premise behind this is that the mood of the individual coupled with the individual's ability to attend to what's having what's going on impacts their ability to make solid decisions and so what that means is i know when emotion needs to be a part of this and i know when i need to pull it back i use emotions appropriately when i am deciding about things um, i'm able to manage and solve problems based on my emotion so I know I know how I'm going to respond this really has to do a lot with awareness of the problem and what the best way to approach it is it's that standard this is not about you it's about the problem okay it annoys me but I understand it's not about me right so decision making has to do with the use of emotions in the process of deciding the action that needs to be taken um, and what's interesting is that uh, for some people, they recognize the decision needs to have an emotion. So it needs to be thoughtful. It needs to be solemn. It needs to be celebratory. It needs to be whatever it is. And so people who have a high skill in this area are able to match the emotion to the decision that needs to be made. Achieving is also another one. If you've got a low score in this, it does not mean that you are not an achiever. It has to do with the use of emotions in the process of achieving. So people who have a high score in this uh, tend to experience pleasure and success. Um, they take more responsibility for their own actions. They actually um, enjoy a moderate level of risk because they enjoy being able to win or to, to overcome. Um, they tend to have fewer, this, this fourth one has to do with they tend to manage stress also pretty well, that, that, that they enjoy the excitement. And so they tend not to let stress become a, a physical manifestation for them. And they look for ways and find ways to make most of the tasks they do personally relevant and meaningful. It's one thing to achieve, it's another thing to achieve something I don't care about. And so people who have a high level of skill in this area tend to do that. And then finally, influencing. And influencing is considered an emotional skill because it has to do with my strengths and my ability to use my strengths and emotions in getting you on board and encouraging you to take a particular action. So people who are highly emotional, uh, uh, highly emoji, <laughs> highly emotionally intelligent, that's where that came from, um, not only tend to assert themselves, but they tend to assert themselves positively. Right, so, so the ability for someone to coerce you or scare you or push you to do something means that they're aware that that emotion makes you act, but it only makes you act in the moment. The person who is highly influential usually brings positive emotion. They usually recognize success. They recognize your contribution. They recognize your strengths, and they influence you through enhancing those strengths and um, and abilities for your success as well as theirs. And they tend to exhibit a, exhibit a positive and confident disposition. So those are the elements that are in these models, and you'll see they overlap with self-awareness and all of those that I talked about before. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Find out where I am. So without making a huge group effort of this will take you know, maybe just 10 minutes or so. But if you would kind of back the chairs away 
and maybe just with a couple of people on each side of you. Okay, for the sun, that's a complicated task. Obviously, you can't, yeah, never mind. You can find ways to talk to like two other people, right? So we'll have smaller groups of, of three. Um, what I'd like you to do is take a few minutes to talk about your overall results, what you're willing to share about your overall results. Specifically, did they feel accurate to you? So once you did it and read it, when you read it, did it sound like that might actually be you? And then finally, if you had to work on one area from that assessment, so if that assessment were true and you had to work on one area, what area would it be? Okay? And this is just a small discussion between you and a couple of folks around you, and we'll take 10 minutes, 12 at the most, and then we'll come back and kind of wrap this up and do something with it. Ready, set, go.
about this assessment is it's actually built as a multi-rater assessment. And so one of the things a person can do um, if they choose to like open their bank account is um, you can answer it and you can send this survey about yourself to a group of other people. And for those who look at their uh, reports and they say, okay, answer it honestly, oh, I don't buy, I'm not sure that that's really accurate. Usually when you have three, four, five other people respond, the end result is a different consideration. <laughs> because then the end result is something like, wow, really? Huh. And they're wrong too. <laughs> um, any thoughts, anything you'd share about if you had to work on one area, what it would be? assessment but on that continuum I'm a high F very mm -hmm. feeling right mm -hmm. and so I was thinking you know so my go-to is how do I feel about this decision how's it going to impact other people how are they going to feel and so one of the things that you said you said a lot it was fantastic was no one to pull the emotion out of the decision and when to keep it in right mm -hmm. so I just know that that's one thing that I have to continually work on yep. because of my personality so yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. During my corporate career, I had uh, a couple of wonderful bosses, but I had one that took the, we did 360 feedback, and, and people struggled with being honest about it. He did not. And, um, and so his feedback to me one time, and I still remember, and it, it was really impactful, was if you feel like this is something you want to do, you do it better than anybody I know. And if it doesn't provoke that in you, you're not so quick to do it. And of course, I was like, you're wrong. <laughs> but it was. I mean, it was, and it was the same kind of thing. It had to do with I did things based on how I felt about the things I was doing, and not necessarily because they absolutely had to get done. I would get them done. Mm -hmm. But it would be because I had to, right? Because I was just dragging that task along with me, and I just don't want to do it. And so, you know, when you start to think about it, like your observation, that kind of thing, you say, wow, actually feelings do kind of play a role in what I decide. Because a lot of times you look at decision making like I have a problem in front of me, I have to decide what to do. Sometimes it's, I have to decide what to do, right? It's the, where do I go with it? Good. Any other thoughts? I did hear some preach it, sister, when you said decision making, there was a little bit of an amen that was in the room. So. <laughs> So I don't want to take too long on this. And actually, this is the kind of thing that's sort of a self-reflection anyway. It's the kind of thing you can talk to your friends about. Often, the value of these kinds of meetings that you have is they give you something later, right? So I do, I don't do Myers-Briggs um, anymore. I got to, um, I do uh, a couple of other uh, personality things. And, I, and I'm convinced that the reason that they're valuable is they give people a topic to think about and talk about later. So, um, I encourage you to do that. But let me give you a couple of suggestions um, 
about kind of the top tool, top two tools. Um, so if there's anything on that list that you're wanting to work at, and this is kind of my opinion through my work as a coach and also teaching this and doing this for a long time, is there are two things that I think you can focus on regardless of where you want to improve, and that's self-awareness and empathy. Because we know that if you are not aware of your emotions and you're not aware of how these emotions actually play a role in how things work for you, it's very hard to make other adjustments. And we all know that person, again, don't look at them right now because they'll know if you're looking at them, but we all know that person who is less self-aware than others. I find myself using that phrase often, actually, uh, when it comes to trying to work with somebody with, do you actually not understand how you're being interpreted right now? And the answer is no. So let's try to help you figure that out. So self-awareness is like one of the biggest, right? Is to be aware, think about what you saw. Uh, you're the tool you're working with. Um, and the other is to have greater interpersonal sensitivity, which does not sound like a choice, but it actually is. So one of the things that I, and actually my family, my, my kids provoke this, uh, and then I, when I'm talking to them, I realize that, huh, this might be another thing they got from me that I didn't even realize I was doing. And it was, and this is just a personal thing, but it was to start from the premise that whoever has annoyed you is not an idiot, and they think they're doing the right thing, <laughs> right? Because most of us don't go around thing, thinking to ourselves, I'm going to do the wrong thing. And this goes all the way back to Plato before, is it might actually be that there's a lot of stuff you just don't know, right? So an example not too long ago was there was a woman carrying a, a box and a baby. <laughs> it was weird to begin with. Um, so she had a box in this hand, she had a, a baby carrier in this hand, and she was flat running over people. I mean, she was just, it was elbows and, and the corner of this thing. I mean, I, that baby was a weapon. You know, she was you know, kind of moving through. And it was one of those examples where one of my kids were like, that was rude. And I said, you know what? It was, but stop for a second. Let's see, we could come up with a story about this person that would make it not rude, right? For one thing, bless her heart, she's carrying a box and a baby. Who knows what's going on? Why do we automatically get annoyed at her? Why don't we go, boy, I'm glad I'm not carrying a box and a baby. I can preach on not carrying a baby right now. <laughs> I have two teenagers, and yeah, that's a different thing. So you can start to do that. By the way, it's really hard. I'm still a jerk 90% of the time, but every once in a while I catch myself thinking, you know, I'm not giving them the benefit of the doubt. Doesn't it make it a little more pleasant if I give them the benefit of the doubt? And I don't know that I will ever get much better at that. But I try. And that's kind of, you know, this notion of saying, you know, I, I can choose to be more aware and I can choose to be more sensitive. And besides, if I try to do that, I'll have better work, I'll have better relationships. Um, and it's likely that if I have better work and personal relationships, then life in general is just going to be better. <laughs>
self-awareness and self-awareness and building emotional intelligence is that part of the problem is that we typically are not aware of it, right? It just happens, and we are so accustomed to it happening, and our, our, our emotions, responses, and all of this. So one thing is to take the time for some mindfulness. And since I've created this slide, mindfulness has gone to be a really big concept. So I'm not trying to get too far into capital M mindfulness as much as I'm just simply saying, take some time to think about what just happened, right? So come out of that meeting thinking to yourself, why am I annoyed? Or why did I respond that way? Those kinds of things can, you know, by themselves make us more aware. Uh, recognize and name emotions. This seems pretty simple, but but it really isn't. I mean, when we recognize that that all of this isn't totally ticked off, I mean, we have some big labels, right, that we use to do lots of emotions. When I say I'm ticked off, which I rarely say it exactly that way, but you know what I'm getting at. Um, when I say I, I mean lots of things. I mean I'm a little bit annoyed. I'm a lot annoyed. I'm mad. I'm you know whatever. And so the idea here is to think about exactly what is that emotion that you've got going on right now, and then what provoked it. Um, and really pay attention to the triggers. This is a huge key to what is it that's making you respond emotionally that way. So one of the things that we've talked about, or one of the things that happens sometimes in an organization like this is we respond to people from certain areas because once upon a time, 15, 20 years ago, we got ticked off at somebody who worked in that area. And now they're gone, but we somehow generalized how we felt about that person to how we felt about that department or how we felt about that area. And so now all we gotta know is that they come from there. And so part of this is to pay attention to, are you really responding to what you think you're responding to? Or does it just look like your ex-husband? Right? Does it look like your boyfriend that was a jerk? Or whatever, right? Is it just because of their accent? Is it because of whatever? I mean, there's this, if you pay attention to this, and there'll be some moments where you think to yourself, seriously, myself, this is what it is, right? Okay, so reflect on what provokes it. And reflect on emotional intensity. So the issue is, you know, we're talking, I, I love it. One of the favorite uh, phrases that I had ever since I was a professor prior to my business experience was that the arguments in academics are so heated because the stakes are so low. Um, and so, you know, it's that typical sort of faculty meeting where what we are arguing about is the color of the folio, and we are adamant about it. That at this next orientation that we're going to use these. No, we're not. Why not? And we come up with all kinds of big reasons. We get all ticked off. We get mad at the end of the fact we go off to different areas, talk about what an idiot, right? I mean, you do all of that. And at some point, you back up and go, are you kidding me? You're talking about a folder. And this has never happened at the DeVos Graduate School. <laughs> but I have other topics that would be similar. So, yeah. And I am one of them, too. You can get me riled up and fired up on something that afterwards I think, Wow, I thought about that for 10 minutes in the meeting. I didn't think about it ahead of time, and I'm not thinking about it now. Why in the world did that make me angry, right? Or why did I get so excited about it? Uh, start with optimism about yourself and other people. This is actually related to emotional intelligence in the sense that, that positivity does breed positivity, and I'm not even getting all flutes in the background. We know we respond to the emotions that are presented to us. And so if we, if we go into a situation with a more positive attitude and we go in thinking to ourselves that the other people in that situation are just as likely to be as valuable and as uh, excited as we are, then we often find that we create that situation. And then finally, uh, well not quite finally, uh, pay attention and listen. Oh my goodness. I'll leave that one there for a minute because this was so hard for us. Um, when I was getting my master's, I actually studied listening. I was actually a member of the International Listening Association. How's that work for you? Right? There is a problem with being a member of the International Listening Association when you are also human because that means other people in your life are going to say things to you like, okay, Mr. Expert Listener. Well, you know, I'm not an expert listener. I just know about listening. Um, it's really hard, especially if our emotions are engaged, right? If we're angry, if we're, or if we're excited, 
we have a direction we want to go, stopping ourselves to pay attention to what's actually being said, what's actually happening is very, very hard. It takes practice. But if you want to improve one of the areas that you're looking at, this is one key. And then finally, checking for emotional understanding. <clears throat> now, this is something that I have adopted into my normal conversation. It felt weird at the beginning. Um, in fact, the first time I heard somebody, uh, you know, <laughs> say, how does that make you feel? I actually thought to myself, never will this happen, but I will say to anyone, how does that make you feel? And darn it, I don't do it all the time. <laughs> but I don't do it quite like that. I use language that works for me, right? But one of the things, and the group I work with, we've gotten actually pretty good at stopping the conversation and saying, hold on. You seem like you just got upset. What just upset you? Did I say, was there something that just happened because the mood just changed? And you know what? After you do that for a while, it actually becomes pretty easy to do. And then you have people who are stepping in saying, hold on, I'm feeling stressed. I just started feeling stressed. I need to interrupt for a minute and talk about what's stressing me about this. You catch that early and the amygdala is still asleep. You aren't on drugs yet. Your brain's just laying there going, eh, whatever. It's not that big a deal. You start doing that, and you can really, so it's worth it. It's really worth every once in a while checking in to say, why is the emotion, in, you know, why is this happening at this moment? Why did you suddenly quit making eye contact? Why are we now loud or rude or whatever? Don't try to change all of it tomorrow, but, you know, find opportunities to do that. I think you'll find it'll be useful. Okay. Questions? I did a quick search on a question I had earlier because there is a Google. And because I wasn't sure I knew the answer to the question. And I'm still not sure I knew the answer to the question. The question was the relationship between emotional intelligence and introversion. And what I was able to find with a very quick search was we don't really know. Um, and I would not be surprised if that's the case because Introversion and extroversion has to do with how I interact with, with the world, how I make meaning of things. And so I think that you could be highly emotionally intelligent and introverted, and maybe even more so introverted, it would depend on what you did with that after, and I just don't know the answer to that. So it's a great question. I've become very skilled at going, eh, I don't know. Yes? Uh, I teach creativity at Northwood. And uh, one segment of the course deals with a particular methodology called design thinking. Yes, I'm and aware of design thinking. Yep. So there's a big component uh, in that methodology which involves empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and your description of the kinds of problems that we have, like in groups, uh, you know, and moving forward, uh, what, what could I do for my students to help uh, prompt, you know, this process so that as they engage in design thinking and they have to go out and they have to look at people in circumstances and, and genuinely engage with their problem, how can I help kind of move them that way? Yeah, well, empathy is not all that easy, right? And yeah. uh, one of the things I can do pretty easily is I can, I can make you aware of what it is and I can show you examples of it. I can't make you care yeah. and somehow Caring is part of empathy, right? I mean, I, I so so I think the trick in some of those cases when you're out in the in the in the wild, right, um, is you know, okay, if that if you see the way that they're behaving, yeah, it's kind of informative to understand what it would mean to you if you were doing that. But what other stories can we come up with, right? What other what other clues can we get that, that maybe it's not that same story? And then why do we care, right? What are we going to do with it once we get there? Um, but empathy is, empathy is hard to teach. Uh, and, you know, I think sometimes, even in a small group, having people explain what's going on with themselves at that moment and then talking about with the rest of the group, okay, what does that tell you now about Jane today? What does that explain about what she's doing based on what we now understand is where she's coming from, right? And, and Maybe there's a way to get there, but it's, I agree, it's not an easy one to do. I think it has to be modeled, and I, have, I, I think it has to be felt a little bit. Um, but then at some point, I either care about why you're doing what you're doing or I don't. Um, 
and then you kind of get to that place. I have got a colleague who teaches design thinking through one of our critical thinking classes, you know, and then it's like, okay, then at least act like you do because we have to get this done. Well, Pretend like it matters. And then action can precede belief. Yes. Right? Yeah. So then, then by doing it, I might go right. on. And you might get there. Yeah. yeah. Now I get it. Anything else? Thank you so much. It is always fun to talk to you. I appreciate it greatly and hope to come back again someday. Thanks. You're welcome. And don't forget next month we have. Oh, I'm okay. bad. <laughs> uh, next month we have a Minecraft meeting luncheon on February 15th, same time. It is going to be located at the Richard DeVos Graduate School of Management. Yay! Yay. And, Come to uh, my house. <laughs> yes, and the topic will be on finance, and it'll be subject matter such as a living will, how to save for your children's uh, education, how to save for your retirement, those type of topics. So there'll be several panel speakers. You'll be able to jump around to those different topics uh, areas and learn about the things that are important. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.